today on Delish Dish, we're going to look at. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this special broadcast of Club Moffat Talks. We are joined today in Mustang's studio in the lobby of Moffat Library by MSU Texas President Haney. Thank you for joining us today. I'm so excited to be here. And also uh, today, uh, instead of Chris, we have Allison Atherton, who is our outreach coordinator. Thank you, Allison, for stepping in for Chris. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And as always, Ryan Samuelson. Thank you for waving into the microphone, Ryan. <laughs> I'm recording video, so it will show up. Okay. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and kick things off uh, with President Haney. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and talk a little bit about your uh, academic administration career. Uh, what led you to that, to pursue a career in uh, academic administration? So I, I think it would probably be misleading to say I pursued it. <laughs> um, I had no... Um, and, and I think it's probably typical of most academics. You enjoy teaching and research and focus on that. And when I was promoted to full professor at Louisiana State University, where I had a career for 33 years before coming here, uh, the, the faculty said, okay, it's sort of your turn to be department chair. And that was sort of the first foray into administration. And I say to everybody, it's also, I think, one of the hardest positions that I've held because you, uh, it really is where the rubber meets the road and, and it's such a, a, a critical um, uh, position on a campus. And I learned an incredible amount, but you're working directly with your colleagues and you're having to regularly say no to this, that, or the other. And so at the end of that three-year term, the faculty, uh, the number of them said, okay, we need you to do another three-year term. And I said, half of you hate me now. If I do <laughs> another one, you will all hate me. So, um, so, but then I had some other opportunities on the campus. And what I, what I found absolutely fascinating is getting to learn the breadth and depth of a college campus. And often when you, you know, I'm a political scientist, I, I teach public law, and so you, you get to know your area, not even political science broadly, but your area well and what you teach and what's happening in your discipline if you're fortunate. But you may not even know what your colleagues are doing on the hall, much less what's happening in sociology or over in agribusiness or what's happening in physics. And so um, I think one of the, the really rewarding aspects of administration is the ability to get to see the really, truly amazing things that happen, the magic, genuine magic that happens on a college campus. And that is one of the problems with uh, academics is they do tend to stay in their little silos and not get out. And I find a lot, it's funny uh, talking to faculty because they assume how their department works is how every department works or how we work when we're staff rather than faculty. And it's, I always have to say, no, that, that's not how everybody does things. Well, and that's interesting, Ryan, because I know even, uh, you know, when I became dean, I assumed all the departments in the college functioned like ours. Well, we're political scientists, so we have bylaws and we have all this and this. And then you found out other departments have none of that. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it's interesting how you, um, you, you learn that, that there's great variability. And especially with things like education where they have all of the accreditation with them. That's, that's, that's different than the accreditation Absolutely. for the rest of the campus and so yes. forth. I can ask my question because I came up with this one. Okay. How has MSU changed since you were a student? You know, it's interesting how the, there's such a familiarity on the campus. And I, I do want to say how grateful I am to the leaders who have been entrusted with maintaining the aesthetic of the campus. So it is, as you know, we mm -hmm. were just voted most beautiful campus. And that does not happen by accident. So very appreciative of the leaders who, as the campus grew, were careful to maintain the beauty of the campus. And also to Kyle Owen, who leads the facilities across our campus, and his, his uh, staff, who just do an incredible job of maintaining it. So the beauty was there. Uh, the students are as fabulous as as ever. Uh, it was interesting at the opening um, convocation, stepping onto that fame, fine arts stage again. Mm -hmm. um, but, but certainly there are new buildings, so it's expanded, which is exciting. 
Um, and then there are also just, again, speaking to, to understanding the breadth more, um, coming back to the campus um, as a president, and of course I was a student worker in the president's office, so it's been interesting <laughs> to, to, as a full circle moment, but seeing the campus very differently from this perspective as I did as a student, but it feels very, very much the same. I agree. I think as a former student, a recent former student, when I toured in 2017, I went to Mustangs Rally, and one of the deciding factors on which school I wanted to choose was the looks of MSU. I loved all the brick and just how beautiful it was, and it felt cozy still at the same time, and that really stood out to me when I was making my choices of, like, where I wanted to go. And what a brilliant choice you made. <laughs> I agree. I really enjoyed my education here, and I enjoy getting to work here now, too. Absolutely. And, you know, when I was doing the interview here, one of the questions I was asked is, well, what would you say is the value proposition for an education from MSU Texas. I was like, I am the value proposition. <laughs> Look what I was able to do with the incredible academic foundation that was provided um, for me. And so to be a part of ensuring that other students get to have that is really, really exciting. So what would you say your vision is of MSU's future in the next five years or the next 10 years even? So we're, we're focused broadly and, and while this is not unique to uh, to our institution, but we really are focusing on access and success. Mm -hmm. So we want to ensure that more and more students find MSU for their academic home. So we're looking at ways in which we need to um, alter what we're doing, how we need to do, expand some of the things, strengthen some of the things that we do well, but to ensure that, um, again, because I appreciate the value of the degree from MSU that we want to make sure more students are here and are able to access our campus. And then secondly, we want to ensure that those students who come are successful. So we want to ensure that we um, provide a structure for that student. So obviously the magic is in the classroom that's happening there. That's always been the case. You and I, all of us can talk about professors we had who were just so uh, inspiring for us. But we know that, that it's challenging um, a challenging environment for students as they're juggling so many balls. And one of the things that I'm, I'm really just so passionate about, 40% or more of our students are first generation students. Mm -hmm. So the very first individual in their entire families to head to college. And if you're in that position and you're told you need to go to the bursar, don't know what a bursar is. And so how do we ensure that students are getting all of the support and the structure that they need? We know they can be successful, but we need to provide to your, that cozy space for them to know that they can be successful. And then also, as we look to this studio as an example, right, of what we want to ensure that our students were maintaining um, as, as Alana, who helped to facilitate the um, studio, mentioned the trending terrain that we are ensuring that our campus, in order for our students to be successful, not just in their degree, but as they step into, into their careers, that they have had the very best possible opportunity on our campus. And so whether those students need to be able to have access to a studio like this or a phenomenal lab that's being re renovated as we speak in our Bowen Science Hall, the amazing new um, you know, health sciences, college that we're ensuring our students have that. So for me, it will be bursting at the seams and vibrant and exciting space for our students. Well, that I, sounds I, so do wanna, I do wanna emphasize one other thing that we're really focused on is building an incredibly robust relationship with, the, with Shepherd Air Force Base. Um, they, uh, both MSU and the base are critical economic drivers for our community. And we want to be that pillar and partner for North Central Texas, and that it's incumbent upon us to ensure that the airmen who are coming to the base can begin their, their educational journey with us, and then as they move on to their next um, place they're stationed, 
we have an incredibly robust online portfolio of degrees. They'll be able to take MSU with them. Again, we've got to build that support structure to ensure that we are the best possible partner so that we can see those airmen be successful in their careers. And whether that's on the, the um, technical training side or it's on the pilot side, we have the, those undergraduate degrees, we have the master's level degrees for those, um, those individuals to become lifelong learners with us. So very excited about what that partnership will look like in five and 10 years. And that's something that's again you've gone back to. I remember when I first came here, that was a big part of uh, the Shepherds Air Force Base training things. Just because the number of female librarians would say, "Did you see the Italian pilots? The Italian pilots are back. <laughs> Where they were over there. Let's, let's okay. Let's all go watch them." It was it was very funny. Uh, they used to laugh at all the all the. Well, in my <laughs> master's program here in political <laughs> science, we would have the pilots from the Euro-NATO Joint Jet Pilot mm -hmm. Training Program. The Italians are, have been a. We just celebrated the 40-year anniversary with them here on campus. Um, they would be in the class with me, which was phenomenal for me as a student to be sitting with individuals from across the globe talking about whatever the, the issue was. And, and we want to, again, that's fantastic for our students um, to be able to have those opportunities to, um, to be in classes with, with those students. So, so it's very, very excited about that. I think it's a smart move for like the community of Wichita Falls as well, because as someone who lives here, there's kind of like pockets of Wichita Falls. It's a big town, but it doesn't feel like a big town sometimes because like you have the college campus here of MSU, this area, and then Shepherd Air Force Base is kind of farther away and it's like its own little secluded area. And then you have like the Iowa Park of it all and all of the areas like that. So it's great to partner with Shepherd Air Force Base and kind of combine two communities already in the same town and get them partnered together. Right. I think it can make a lot of change, not only for MSU and for the base, but for Wichita Falls as a whole. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's certainly our goal. Um, we, we are here uh, recording for the very first time in Mustang Studio, uh, and we just had our grand opening ceremony. Uh, how do you hope that this studio will be used by the campus community? You know, Alana, who helped to shepherd this, was interested in uh, creating a podcast as a student. And there wasn't a generally available space. And I think students are just so creative. And we in no way want to limit that. We want to facilitate that creativity. But faculty are incredibly creative too, right? So to be able to have an opportunity for both our faculty and our students to uh, come into this space and work on whatever that scholarly creative endeavor might be. You know, I think as a political scientist, I teach civil rights and liberties, I teach judicial politics, how great it would be for students to say, look, you can write a research paper, or if you want to do a podcast about a particular case and you go through the history of it, um, maybe you talk with a local attorney and do, add them into your podcast, um, talk to uh, the plaintiff and the respondent in those cases. What an amazing opportunity for students to learn a skill set, number one, um, learn to communicate, learn to think critically about those issues and what are the, the kinds of questions that would be valuable to listeners. So super excited about that, but I could imagine our community using this as well. So individuals throughout the entire, um, you know, North Texas area saying, oh, wait, there's a space over at, you know, Moffitt Library that we could help to get word out about whatever exciting thing is happening in the community. So I, th I am really excited about it. I think there will be many, many different opportunities. I think that's a great way to bring up, like, assignments that it could be a podcast instead, you know, bringing that into the classroom, like a studio like this could really be the first building block towards like the future of education. Right. And especially here at MSU Texas, it really shows like what we're working towards and what is to come. Like there's so much room for growth and how you've talked about like creativity, like a studio like this can really foster that. Well, then I think too, when you think about what are critical skills that students need, right? They need to be able to write clearly. Mm -hmm. So we need to be able to, to nurture that skill set, but you need to be able to communicate. And this is a medium that students will have to 
really think about what is it what I want to say? How do I communicate that to an audience? But that's a skill set that is transferable um, as students move into their careers. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, too, since COVID, not to bring up COVID because I know everyone still gets like a little jolt when they hear COVID. They're like, oh, no. But ever since COVID, I feel like some students have struggled with social skills because so many students had to be online for so long. Like my cousin, he had to do online schooling for like two years because of COVID. And then going back to the classroom was really uncomfortable and awkward. And it felt very weird for him. And I know a lot of students in high school and college, probably even adults who are students are feeling that. So I think you're right about like communication and then something like this, opening up those communication skills for students. Absolutely. Okay. So um, if we are so glad to have you at MSU, but if you were not the university president, what might you be doing instead? Did you have a second choice of career? So the original plan before I got the call from the search committee for MSU, I was going to be on sabbatical in South Africa. So if I weren't doing this, I would have been working on the, the, the next research project. But it was interesting, during my master's degree here, uh, I was really interested in going to law school after that and, and being an attorney. Very excited about that. And I did an internship while I was here in the district attorney's office here for Wichita County. And I discovered then that I really liked studying the law. I thought that seemed much more attractive to me than doing it. <laughs> so, and, and I've always just loved learning. I'm one of those students that got excited about exams. I know I'm embarrassed to say that. <laughs> and, um, it, and this was also just a way to think about how can you just be a student forever? And this is um, an academic is one of those um, career paths. But, um, you know, I, I grew up on my grandfather's um, dairy farm and was sent to the cotton patch where he grew cotton and wheat was sent to the cotton patch at eight to chop the weeds from the cotton and then was driving the tractor by 10 like a pro mm -hmm. so I might still be on the farm which would be a, a obviously a, a great profession have nothing but respect for farmers but for higher education but for the opportunity to go to college to be able to think about how would I spend my life's labor. And I'm just so grateful for MSU and for the opportunity that comes um, to our students to think, I, you know, I wanted to see more of the world than the red dirt of, of Clay County. Not that I don't love that dirt. It has nurtured my roots and I am incredibly grateful for it. Um, but I wanted to see more, and higher education was a path for me to do that. So I, I just, um, again, I never envisioned being a university president, uh, but I am passionate about the transformative power of higher education. Well, I think that passion clearly shows from the opening meeting we had in August to just most of the events I've seen you at and what I see you do on social media. I think it shows that you really shine as like the MSU president. Aww. Well, you're very kind. Thank you. Oh, and on that, I guess we could go ahead and ask who or what inspires you? Well, and what a fantastic segue because our students, they are incredibly inspiring. And as I mentioned, so many of our students are first generation. So they're, they're entrepreneurs for their families, right? They're stepping into the unknown. They are taking a, a risk um, and their families, obviously this is new to them um, as well. And they are having to juggle so many things that are so new to them that certainly for my children, you know, if my children had a question about the bursar, I knew who to pick up the phone and figure it out. But we forget that not every student has the capacity to navigate that. And I always say students should just get three hours of credit for navigating the bureaucracy that is, uh, uh, you know, registering and all of that um, on a college campus. But they're just crushing it. 
it's just so amazing. And so I truly, I am inspired every day that I get to wake up and, and just work on behalf of the students and the faculty and the staff who call this place home. So absolutely, um, our students are just so inspiring. And I'll do a shout out for TASP since they're just right next yes. door to us about what they do for um, trying to educate students on education, on higher education, how it works. And explain TASP is our tutoring Tutoring center. and, yeah, our tutoring center, tutoring and. Academic support programs. Academic support. And we have so many of our students who access that. We are getting more and more of them to that. When we talk about the support structure, that's one of those really critical spaces on our campus for students who can come. And regardless of what it is you're working with, they will connect you to individuals who can support you in whether it's your math course or your writing course or you're trying to figure out how to do a podcast or your work, at whatever it is. There is um, people there whose sole job is to help you be successful. So yes, thank you for mentioning that. Um, I think that's a, a fantastic example of spaces on campus where we are trying to ensure students are, are supported. Yes, and they do so much for first generation students specifically. Like they have so many things targeted towards first gen students, you know, on a campus that they're not used to, not familiar with, and don't know how to navigate. So it's a great shout out to TASP. Um, I, I love the answer that you're inspired by our students. Um, do you have uh, people that you look up to, that you admire? Do you have heroes? Well, I know this is going to sound really trite, and you're going to hear the continual um, theme about education, but I am, uh, my parents are my personal heroes and I, I'm so very sad that they've both passed because it my father um, went back to school in his 30s with three small children to MSU and you talk about an entrepreneur to take a leap of faith um, he was teaching on an emergency basis uh, at Henrietta um, high school where uh, I graduated and he was uh, teaching biology and chemistry taught me biology and chemistry but he went back to school and it was incredibly challenging times for our family um, for my father to do that and uh, he you know he and my mother celebrated 60 years of marriage and were just a, a phenomenal exam examples in so many ways but I can remember in one of uh, my father's biology classes with Dr. Dahlquist, and he had to get so many examples of, you know, different mammals, um, so small rice, uh, mice and, and rats. And so we would go and capture those, which he had to, you know, do all the genus and species and all of that. And he would be doing those very early in the morning before he went into work. And then MSU worked with him for his... Um, to schedule his classes was so off period and his lunch hour so that he could get up here, take a class, get home. And they were wonderful to work with him to ensure he was able to, to complete that degree. And, you know, I, one of my most vivid memories as a child, my, um, we, the family, so I have um, two siblings, so there were five of us, and we would go to the Pizza Hut over there, it used to be, um, North Town, and we would order one large pizza and all leave hungry and fighting over the pieces. And, you know, my father turned to my mother and said, when I graduate from MSU, we are coming back to Pizza Hut and we are all ordering our own large pizza. And that day we went to, um, I, I remember my dad graduating and what an amazing achievement it was for him, for our family, how it transformed our lives, all of our lives. And we headed over to Pizza Hut when it was over and the wait staff came over to me and I was very young at the time, I don't know, seven, eight. And um, what would you like, young lady? And I said, I want a large hamburger pizza. And the man turned to my father and said, do you know how large the piece is? And he said, yes, and she wants a large one. And we ordered five of them. It was a phenomenal day of celebration. And you know, when we were moving here and you know, trying to purge things, um, and I found uh, my father's diploma from MSU for his undergraduate degree. And inside that was the canceled check to the Pizza Hut. Oh. Um, which for me, 
was so symbolic of what it is we do in each and every day. And I know sometimes we get, we get removed from that, right, in, in our daily work. And it was just such an incredible, incredible reminder of what it is we do, the best gig on the planet, to get to be a part of that journey. And, you know, my father went on to teach thousands of students over his decades um, at uh, Henrietta Teaching Biology and Chemistry, many who, you know, went on to become um, very successful lawyers and physicians and working in our oil fields and working in our manufacturing plants and, you know, even a university president. So, it, so again, when I, I, I have yeah. such great admiration for him. And he also came back and got his master's degree here. So. Oh. Wow. I know. No, that's amazing. That's great. Uh, do you have a, a personal motto, a credo that you live by? You know, it's interesting. My daughter um, has gotten into needlepoint, and about, um, I guess about two years ago, she brought to me um, a needlepoint she had done for me, and it says, good people do things for other people, the end. Mm. And I think if we could all just keep that in mind, just do things for other people, the end. It's pretty simple. So I try to, try to live by that. Um, and try to, um, it, it's so easy to get focused internally on our concerns and our issues and our problems. So trying to be externally focused. Um, and then the other thing, my sister, um, I, my daughter also gave me these cards that sit on my desk that rotate and they have an inspiring. And um, one of them is um, that, uh, comparison is the thief of joy. Mm -hmm. So if you if you look around at others and think, oh, and, and somehow you think their lives are less challenging or that they somehow are, it, 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 that is not the human condition. And we should understand that everybody has their challenges and um, nobody is exempt from that. And buckle up and head on down the road. I like that. I like that. Um, do you have a, a morning r routine or a ritual? How, how do you prefer to start your day? So when COVID hit and I could no longer go to a gym, I would get up in the morning and walk. Mm -hmm. So I was in Baton Rouge and I would do my walk and my sister was here in Henrietta and she would get up and so we would and I knew she was walking, so then we started just having a phone conversation every morning. And then uh, when I moved here, and I'm still getting up and doing my morning walk, well, my brother who lives here wanted in on the party. <laughs> so now my brother and my sister and I, um, when we're all up and at the same time, um, we walk and talk, and it's just been so, and the time really flies um, catching up. Now, I confess that when it was 10 degrees, uh, what was that last week? I, yeah. I did not get up. I, I, I have uh, weathered 28 degrees, survived that, but that was a little, little cold. But my, my sister informed me, you, you better just bundle up because if you're going to think that you're going to just not walk those mornings where it's a little too cold, you're not going to get a lot of walking on around, walking in around here. So I do that, and then I... I I am an avid caffeine consumer, so then I have to start the day with a fantastic cup of coffee. Yeah, that, that's completely fair. And I, I will say the, the walking, I, while obviously there are, there are enormous health benefits, I, I have to confess I am in a committed relationship with sugar. Mm. Yeah. So it's essential that I exercise because of that committed relationship. <laughs> I can appreciate that. Right. Um, it's I, I find it a I find it a little bit difficult to to trust people that um, don't eat sweets. Right. What's up with that? Well, yeah. okay. I I did discover, and I'm I'm not going to call her out, but someone that I'm on a committee with oh. <laughs> uh, just recently revealed that uh, culturally, she was not exposed to cookies. 
she did not have cookies oh, that's child abuse. growing growing up and that she still doesn't really get it she's like that's tragic yeah um i at a, a for a recent committee i had taken homemade cookies and set them out and she's like yeah those look good i'm not going to eat those wow just okay. yeah i mean she did not literally say that partly because She's honestly too nice to have said that, but but that was very much the, the that was the inner voice in your head. Yes, that's 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 the way I heard it. It's like no, I'm not I'm not doing that. But no, she she explained, um, and it was just a because of uh, the area of the world where she grew up, sure. how she was raised. They just didn't have cookies, and I said something uh, then in the meeting about that I had only recently read uh, that the country of China really doesn't have cheese. Oh. And that blows my mind wow. because I cannot imagine my life with food right. without cheese. Oh, right. And so she told a story about that she didn't grow up with cheese either and oh. she went to somewhere and saw a ball of mozzarella <laughs> and thought that it was tofu <gasps> and asked for it and ate some and said, this is terrible tofu. This is really bad. Um, oh my gosh, that's hilarious. But uh, just just a a, a, a a huge difference in culture that did not occur to me at all. Well, you know who is a phenomenal baker mm. and makes amazing ginger snap cookies? Karen Moriarty, oh. faculty senate president. Oh my gosh, that woman can bake. I'm just telling you. Okay. Yeah. We'll need to be at the next function. Yes, yes. I'm just saying. Uh, to answer your cheese question, I know the answer to that one. Uh, Two-thirds of the human race is lactose intolerant. Only people of European descent actually have the gene that allows them to uh, process uh, glucose uh, in, uh, as adults. The things you can learn on a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Well, uh, to, to be fair, Ryan has worked reference for 20-plus years. So 35 <laughs> now, I think. You always win the <laughs> trivia games, huh, Ryan? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he does, actually. Okay. Uh, well, we are in a library, so I have to ask you, uh, are you reading anything currently? Okay, so I'm going to do a shameless plug here because I have been reading the page proofs for my book that will be coming out with my co-authors, Kirk Randazzo, who is at the University of South Carolina, and Reggie Sheehan, who was at Michigan State, is now at the National Science Foundation. So our book does privilege prevail, litigation in high courts across the globe, analyzes uh, 15,000 decisions. Um, we built the data set for this of the high courts of India, South Africa, the Philippines, Canada, United Kingdom and Australia. And it looks at um, who wins and why, and especially to see if you are able to bring more resources to bear in a case, are you more likely to win? And the answer is yes, in some contexts, but no in others that you might find surprising. So reading that book, so that, that has been an endeavor, but excited that that will be out in April. So mm. super excited about that. But I'm also reading, uh, tough and Competent, which is uh, Leadership in Team Chemistry, um, that was written by Krantz, who's the American, he was an aerospace engineer and served as NASA's uh, chief flight director for missions of Mercury, Gemini, Apollo programs, and it's fascinating about that, that period of history. Uh, and so really, really um, excited, excited about that. It's fun. It's a really fun read. What is the process like working on a book with other people and especially, I'm assuming, not being like in the same place all the time? Is that really hard to navigate, like working on it? Well, I, so I was the lead author. So uh, that I had the responsibility of, okay, uh, Kirk, I need you to get me these tables mm. and I need this uh, in tomorrow. I've got to get these figures. And Reggie, if you can track down this citation on Australia, because he did the field work there. Um, but they were super responsive. These are, are decades-long colleagues. So it, it was really terrific. And this was a book that uh, was in the making. We initially uh, began the field work in building the data set 20 years ago yeah. with funding from the National Science Foundation. And there were four of us originally building the data set. and um, my mentor from University of North Texas, Neil Tate, 
and Don Songer, who was at the University of South Carolina. And um, I was responsible for the data for India, South Africa, and the Philippines, and um, Reggie and Don and Neil helped with part of the Philippines, but they were uh, responsible for Canada, the UK, and Australia. So there was a lot of collaboration and coordination, many, many grad students, as you could imagine. And then I peeled off to administration, and uh, Neil did the same, and Reggie went off to NSF, and, um, and then Don very tragically passed of brain cancer, and then Neil very tragically passed his aorta burst at breakfast one morning. And I think it took the sale out of the project for mm -hmm. Reggie yeah. and for me. And then uh, when I returned to faculty a few years ago, I was like, I, I have got to finish this book. It must be done, especially to honor Don and, and to honor Neil. And so it, it's just so exciting for me that we, and it's coming out with the University of Virginia Press. So we're really, really excited. I'll make sure the library gets copy. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Put that in the uh, social media when it comes out, too. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So really excited just because of the journey of that, of that book. And, uh, you know, it's, it's grounded in research about winners and losers in courts. There's a really long, rich um, literature there, but there's not been anything that's um, – and we've done lots of studies around the United States Supreme Court, but mm -hmm. we really haven't done – the comparative analysis, looking across international, the globe. correct, and so maybe those theories are applicable, maybe not. So this this allows us to test for that. So yeah, but it was a it was coordinating. But you know, like like most things these days, you're able to email back and forth, mm -hmm. and, and but but many phone calls and Zoom conferences, and yeah, but we're we're right at the the end of it now so super well now i want to talk about your book for the rest i know of well we'll do another <laughs> podcast on that okay. once it comes out we'll do like a deep dive analysis yes so would great. love it um so uh, uh what about uh, things that you've read in the past do you have any uh favorite uh past reads or things that you look at as classics in your own point of view well i mean there are a number of of political science works and those kinds of things because, you know, I am an academic. But I, but I have to say that I recently read Ron Kitchen's book, Uniquely You, and he is the, the new president of the Wichita Falls Chamber. And Ron has been here, I think, just celebrated a little over a year. So he's also new to the community. And he has done um, the kind of, of economic development work um, with other chambers um, is in Missouri and Corpus, but just done really, really phenomenal work. But but this book talks about his journey. He grew up in a very with in a very impoverished family, but he had really um, amazing mentors in his community who took him at a very young age under their wing, and these were very, very successful businessmen and helped him through college. So he was one of those first generation students, right? And, um, you know, when Ron blew a tire and what am I gonna do with my car? And they would see to it that he could have that. So he could, con that kind of thing that can literally derail a student. And so it's a really, really inspiring uh, book. And then also, but it, but it really is focused about on leadership and focused especially on be who you are if you're a leader, don't try to impersonate somebody else. Don't try to be a different individual. You need to look to what are your strengths and maximize those and look at your weaknesses and try to determine how you minimize those. But don't be someone you're not. You, if you are not uniquely you, it is really easy to tell. And individuals will want to follow people who are genuine. Um, and so it was just, it's a terrific book. I really recommend it. Ron's fabulous. Excited to work with him. I'm getting to be, I, I was invited to be on the um, executive board of the chamber. Oh. So really excited about that. And Ron and the chamber are focused on really cementing a university town. That's one of their objectives. And they're also excited to support our partnership with Shepard. And so he gave me the book when I uh, first came to town and, and it's just really terrific really terrific read. That sounds good. That does sound good. Yeah. Um, what about uh, in uh, the world of video? Do you have TV shows you can't miss, or do you have particular 
type of movie that you really enjoy watching? So I um, was, uh, I don't know if you've seen Welcome to Wrexham. Oh yes. oh, yes. Oh, the Ryan Reynolds? It's like the real life Ted Lasso. Oh. Oh, my gosh. You couldn't script it. Like, it, it, you wouldn't believe it. If it were a hot, you would go, oh, yeah, that's a good script. It's For a while, I was looking at the, the weekly scores of Wrexham. Well, and, right? <laughs> um, so, but it's, a, but it's basically um, uh, Rob McElhaney decides that how do you buy a soccer club? Because that happens uh -huh. um, in, in the United Kingdom. And so he looked that up and decided he had some, you know, TV star money, but he didn't have – you know, Movie superhero money. money. <laughs> so he and Ryan Reynolds bought this this soccer club, football club in um, Wrexham, and invested in it. And well, they did a ton of research too. They beforehand. did, and and the community was really skeptical, right? Here mm -hmm. were these two rich Americans coming over to take over our community, and they they did a tremendous amount of work that they were there to support that community, to build that community, to build that club. And so Netflix creates this this documentary around it. But it's just absolutely fabulous. But I also have to confess I'm a true crime junkie, oh. especially as somebody who studies public law, um, looking at the way in which you know law enforcement uh, integrates with the legal system. And um, so, you know, I love me a good 2020. Mm. Okay. And uh, if, if for those of you who didn't hear that, that's that's Chris deep into his heartbreaking <laughs> when when the, when the president says that because as you know, he and his wife are huge true crime junkies. Yeah, they are. Yep, yep. Well, <laughs> and I did just watch the Barbie movie, which I thought was fabulous. Oh, I really, I really loved the Barbie movie. I loved the Barbie movie. I mean, I was target demographic, so you would hope I would love it, but <laughs> it worked. It worked on me. Well, and you know, when I was growing up, my dad every year would give me a Barbie. So I had this large collection of Barbies. And then, I don't know, I was 12 or something, and I was growing out of the Barbie phase, and so my dad didn't give me a Barbie. And he turned to my mom and said, I will never have a Christmas again where she does not get a Barbie. And so, you know, I was 40 years old, still getting a Barbie from my dad. <laughs> so, so I have massive collection of Barbie dolls. But I thought the movie was exceptionally well done. It was really terrific. Oh, yeah. I also got a lot of Barbies growing up and I really liked weird Barbie because I was the kid who cut the hair of the Barbies and drew on the Barbies <laughs> and really gave them a whole plot and story for like why was their hair cut why do they have these scribbles okay, everywhere that's, that's creative and that's so creative. I love well I also like Kate McKinnon I think she's really funny so I loved weird Barbie I thought that was really great. And also, I used to have a lot of Barbie birthday cakes growing up. Oh, right. Like, you know, where you would, like, stick the Barbie yes. in and then yes. the cake was the dress? Yes. I even did a baking competition with my granddad where we did a Barbie cake. You go, girl. We didn't win, oh. but. Oh. You were robbed. I, I was robbed because the people who won their cake was a sheet cake. And it was, you know how you can print, like, the edible photos? Yeah. Uh, it was a sheet cake with their family photo on it, and they won first place. Wow. And I was. I mean, it was at a church, so I was trying to be respectful, but the car ride home, I was letting everyone know how <laughs> upset I was. That's so great. That's awesome. Oh, wow. Um, I, I have always thought that Kate McKinnon is really, really funny, uh, but I just saw, and this is not a brand new movie, but I just saw the movie yesterday, uh, which is about... Uh, a, a, a man who suddenly works wakes up in a world where everyone has forgotten the Beatles. Oh and, yes, and, and and no one remembers right. their 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 music. I remember that movie. Um, that was Kate, fabulous. Kate McKinnon is in that as a studio executive, and she is terrifying, just because she is she's so well epitomized that just cold blooded shark just in it for the money business executive uh and i i was scared of her mm -hmm. and i have never ever mm -hmm. been afraid of her before <laughs> but i was like oh you know what she's like actually really underrated this girl can act mm -hmm. yeah um, but I, I hadn't had that realization before 
I probably should have. I think that happens a lot with uh, actors who get stuck in comedy roles a lot where people will put them in that box and they think like, oh, well, you can't do like the drama or the crying scene. You can't do the big blowout fight. So people will like minimize them. But I've heard a lot of even actors recently talking about how they think comedy is a much harder genre to act in than drama because comedic timing is something really hard to you can't even really perfect it. You kind of just hope for the best sometimes with it. So I think that that you're right, like definitely underrated. And also people on SNL sometimes I think get underrated because there's like lovers and haters of SNL, but everybody's probably done a cringy SNL skit that's been on there. And I think that, you know, sometimes people will knock them down for that. Like, oh, I saw that one skit. So you're not very good when that's just not true. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I actually remember when Saturday Night Live started, um, my uh, brother said something about it, and I realized it existed because I was still in like elementary school, I think, or something when it started, but uh, started making myself stay up late on Saturday nights so that I could, could watch it. Remember Land Shark? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> I love Land Shark. Yes. Uh, really phenomenal. And, and Jim Belushi. Yeah, uh, brilliant. But, uh, just a brilliant comedian. Absolutely. Okay, uh, one last fun question before we close out. Uh, what about games? Do you do you play games at home? Do you do board games, card games? Do you happen to do video games or stuff on the PC? Or you know, I I have some uh, like a couple of card games on the phone mm-hmm. that that I do. I don't do Candy Crush or any of those. When we, when we lived here at Wichita Falls before, there were a group of us who would play Uno. I don't know mm-hmm. if you oh, yeah. remember no, Uno. Yeah, yeah. But I've gotten away from that. I really want to learn how to play like Mahjong or Bridge, yeah. which I, I don't do any of that. But, but as we wrap this up, I love a good podcast. Oh. Mm. So if I'm not talking to my brother or my sister when I'm walking or I'm at the gym, I'm listening to a good podcast. And, of course became addicted when Serial first burst onto the scene, if you remember, which was the original sort of podcast about the wrongful conviction, uh, murder conviction of Adnan Syed. And then it had a companion podcast called Undisclosed, Mm -hmm. where you would listen to Serial. And the Serial podcast actually came because uh, one of Adnan's uh, friends who was uh, an attorney and, and felt this they, they weren't getting any relief and so she had contacted the producers of the, that created the podcast but felt like there was so much information that was not disclosed on the podcast that they did the companion piece so those two are among my absolute favorites but I'm um, listening now to um, the List in Trust, which is a really interesting podcast on the history of the Osage Nation mm, mm-hmm. and the list of people who are on the mineral rights mm. for that, which is just absolutely fascinating. And then, um, again, this uh, the because I love the true crime, but the Murdoch murders in South Carolina recently, mm. and there were a number of podcasts, and in class we would – talk about that in the criminal procedure class, what was happening and how, how that was built into it. And several of us in the class got, um, got uh, you know, uh, connected to that. So I'm probably not doing so many of those, not a lot of time. I will say the campus keeps us busy. One oh, of yeah. the things about a college campus is that there's not just something happening on a campus um, any time of the day or night, there are some things, mm-hmm. so multiple um, multiple just amazing things that, that happen across the campus, including getting to do a podcast with you guys. Oh, and with that segue, could you tell our, our people how they can get a hold of our podcast? Oh, uh, how you can get a hold of our podcast. Uh, our regular podcast is called Club Moffat Talks, and you can find us on YouTube or Spotify, or Amazon Music. I was going to say you can also find us on Google Podcasts, and that is currently true, but I have recently learned that Google Podcasts is going away. Oh. Um, And things that are currently on there are shifting over to YouTube Music, Mm. but we're already on YouTube. So, um, And I will say this as well, for those of you who might be hearing um, 
uh, disabled. Um, uh, Joe does a fantastic job of closed captioning all of our videos. We've been doing videos since he's, he's come on. Uh, our, our show is, is kind of the the uh, the brains behind the brawn of me and Chris's wacky things we're trying to begin with. But he goes through and he makes sure that everything's closed captioned uh, every month that we do a podcast. So, again, well, first off, it's since we're presenting it as a university thing and since we have video we're required to but still the extra effort you put in to 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 do that so that people can can follow along or even read our transcripts is 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 i just want to thank you again for doing that you you are welcome um and since we're talking about that there's always something going on uh, on campus or in our community uh let me talk about some things to mention uh in january uh well for uh it's in january but it's uh, this is all in february uh this is not on campus it's the only thing i'm going to mention today that's not on campus uh, i'm actually really excited about this one though uh if you love big band music or swing or jazz please do not miss the world famous glenn miller orchestra which is coming live to wichita falls on february 8th at the forum uh, now everything else is uh, MSU campus adjacent. Uh, the Wichita Falls Museum at Ar of Art at MSU Texas is hosting a vintage Valentine workshop from 5.30 to 7 on Thursday, February 8th, and from 2 to 4 on Saturday, February 10th. It's uh, taking inspiration from Valentines from the 1950s and 1960s, so participants will create their own Valentines. The Red River Regional Science Fair, sponsored by the McCoy College of Science, Mathematics, and Engineering, will be in the Clark Student Center on February 15th and 16th. Artist Sana Musasama will speak about human trafficking awareness at 6.30 p.m. on Thursday, February 15th in Legacy Hall's multi-purpose room. Following the talk, the Office of Title IX and VI Peer Peer Educators will present information about to Take Back the Night, a movement to end all forms of sexual violence. And Curtis on Tour, a septet of winds and strings from the Curtis Institute of Music, will be guests of the music series at Aiken at 7.30, again also on February 15th. Um, if you'd like to have more information about the things that I just announced or other things going on on campus or around Wichita Falls, uh, please check out the calendar at discoverwichitafalls.com slash events or the events section of the MSU Texas homepage. Um, Dr. Haney uh, or uh, Allison or Ryan, do you have anything else that we need to say before we wrap up for the day? It's been a pleasure having you here today. Also you, Allison, thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. I had a lot of fun. I think this was really nice. And next time you're on, we need to dive more into what you like. I can do that for hours, so <laughs> no well, worries. And thank you so much for inviting me on the podcast. This has been fantastic. Yeah. Thank, thank you, so you for coming. Thank you so much. And uh, to all of our uh, viewers and patrons, uh, thank you for joining us, and we will talk to you again next month. Uh, Ryan, will you hit that stop button next to the record?